Hey there students, and welcome to part two of the compressed practice test for college algebra. I'm going to be starting from question number six. Uh, if you want to watch part one, you can click down here and it will take you back to part one, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and start with number six. It says, listed below are five functions, each denoted uh, g of x, and each involving a real number constant c, which is greater than one. If f of x is... Um, t to the x, which of these five functions use the greatest value for f of g of x for all x greater than or equal to 1. Okay? So in this uh, problem, there are two components. First part is uh, the whole idea of composition. We're going to be doing composition. And after composing the functions, we're going to be ordering the values of this function considering these two constraints right here. Okay? So after composing, we're going to say, okay, which, would be big, which of them will be greatest if c is bigger than 1 and x is bigger than 1, okay? All right, so we're going to do it step by step. We're going to start out by finding g of f of x for all of these, and then we're going to see which is the greatest. All right, so let's start out with part A, okay? Part A. Um, g of x is c of x. Now, what on earth does this mean? It means that well, if, we do, if we want to find f of g of x, we're going to plug in c of x into the function f of x. The function f of x is 2 to the x. So f of g of x is 2. Instead of 2 to the x, there's going to be 2 to the parenthesis c of x. All right, you notice what I did? I replaced that x with g, so c of x. So for A, we're going to have um, 2 to the CX. That's A. All right? Okay. Now, um, write it properly. Let's do the B part. So for the B part, you get CX. For the B part, um, G of X is C over X. So what is F of, F of G of X going to be? F of G of X is simply going to be 2 to the, instead of X, so we're going to substitute the value of g into that x right there. Okay, that's what composition is all about. So instead of 2 to the x, we're going to have 2 to the c over x. Okay, 2 to the c over x. So that's going to give us uh, 2 to the c over x. Okay, all right. Option C, g of x is x over c, the reciprocal of b. So what is f of g of x going to be? f of g of x is what you get when you substitute this value into the x in f. So what are we going to do? We're going to take x over c and plug it into the x upstairs over there, okay? So what is that going to look like? Instead of 2 to the x, I'm going to have 2 to the x over c, okay? You notice how this one, we add 2 to the c over x. This is a reciprocal of that. So for C, we're going to have um, 2 to the x over C, okay? All right, option D, um, G of x is x minus, equals x minus C. So F of G of x is going to be what you get when you take the value of uh, G of x in option D and plug it into the x in F of x, that one right there, okay? So it's going to become f of g of x is going to be 2, instead of 2 to the x, is going to be 2 to the x minus c. All right, so that's what composition is all about. You substitute the x with the input function. Okay, so this is 2 to the x minus c. All right, one more to compose, then we're going to go into ordering, all right? So option E, uh, g of x is uh, log base uh, c of x. So f of g of x, let me put commas here so that you don't get confused. Comma, comma, comma. All right. So f of g of x is going to be what you get when you plug in log base c of x into x. Okay? When I plug this business right here, when I plug this into the power, that's what I'll get as my uh, f of g of x. All right? So that's going to be 2 to the, instead of, to the, instead of uh, 2 to the x, we're going to have um, 2 to the um, log base c of x. Okay? All right, and then, uh, yeah, so 2 to the log base c of x. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to compare which one, which of these uh, is the 
greatest one. Okay? So how on earth am I going to do this? I'm going to, I'm going to rewrite all my compose functions down here so that I can uh, compare them with ease, okay? So option A, uh, option A, f of g of x was, uh, what was it? It was 2 to the cx, 2 to the cx, for option B, f of g of x was 2 to the c over x, and then for option C, uh, f of g of x was q to the x of c and then option d f of g of x was x minus oh wait, uh -huh. it's q to the x minus c and then for option e f of g of x uh was uh q to the log c okay so i'm just writing it because i ran out of space okay so now i want to know which is the biggest after as long as x is bigger than one and c is bigger than one so when you're working in big cases like this all you have to do is you just pick a value of c and x that satisfies these two inequalities okay so since we're going bigger than one i want to pick how about we pick uh, c equals two and x equals two and work that all out and see which of this gives you the biggest one so whichever value gives you the biggest one we guarantee that that will always be the greatest one okay all right so let's do it so with c equals 2 and x equals 2, I'm going to plug that into the x, the x's and the c's here. This one right here is x over c. The x's and the c's here, and I'm going to uh, see which one is the biggest, okay? All right, so for a, uh, we're going to have, for a, is going to be 2 to the, c is 2, x is 2 to the 2 times 2, this is 2 to the 4, which is 16. Option b. It's going to be 2 to the 2 over 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, so it's 2 to the 1, which is just 2. For option C, you're going to have 2. X is 2. C is 2. 2 over 2. Same as this one. 2 to the 1, which is just 2. These are the same. Option D, 2 to the 2 minus 2, which is 2 to the 0. Anything to the 0 is power order than 0 is 1. Option E, 2, oh, wait, 2 to the log. 2 to the log base 2 of 2. 2 to the log base 2 of 2. Log base 2 and 2 are inverses. They cancel out. So this one is just simply 2 to the 1. Remember your rules for logarithm. Log n base n of a is simply a log base n of n. And these are inverses, which is just simply a. So this is basically a. In this case, the power of 2 is 1 right there. So when these two cancel out, you just have 2 to the first power. All right, so option E involves remembering your logarithmic properties. Anyway, that's 2 to the 1, which is just 2. So which is the biggest? Well, we have a tie. These three are the same. But the biggest is option A, which is good. Okay, if we didn't have a bigger value, we would probably pick another number to test. But this one's clearly the largest. And um, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, so um, there you have your answer to number... 6 is A. Okay? A. This is the biggest one. Alright, so moving along. Uh, option 7. It says if a function satisfies f of x with y equals f of x with f of y for every pair of real numbers, x and y, what are the possible values of f of 0? So, let's see. f of 0 if we have f of 0, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us a couple of things. It tells us that um, f of x plus y is going to be f of 0. f of x is going to be f of 0. And f of y is also going to be f of 0. So what does this tell me basically? It tells me that for this scenario, x plus y has to be equal to zero and also x has to be zero and y also has to be zero because we're looking at f of zero okay so if you look at this if i if this equation implies basically that x is equal to y okay because if i have x plus y equals zero uh, i'm sorry 
x equals a negative of y, the opposite of y. Because um, if I have x equals the opposite of y, x equals negative y. Because if I subtract y from both sides, I'll have x equals negative y. Okay? So, what can satisfy these three uh, equations? What can, what number is... What two numbers, what number of x makes it equal to the opposite of y and the x has to be 0 and y has to be 0? What are your possible options? Well, these two alternatives here make it crystal clear what it is. You know x is 0, y is 0, and you know 0 is equal to negative 0 because negative 0 has an orientation. So you have 0 is equal to 0. So with this condition, f of 0, x and y have to be 0. So the values that work that makes this possible is only if um, x and y equals zero. So the answer is zero only. Okay. All right. Moving along to question number eight. It says the imaginary number i is defined by i square, which equals negative one. What is i plus i square plus i to the third all the way to i to the twenty-third? Now uh, you have to remember that. Whenever you're dealing with i's, there's a pattern. It's like cyclical. Every time you get to the fourth power of i, um, the pattern keeps repeating itself. Okay? So what on earth am I talking about? I'll check this out. What is i? Let me make space here. What is um, i to the first power? i to the first power is just um, i. Okay? What is i to the second power? i to the second power by definition is negative 1. All right. How about i to the third power? Well, i to the third power is equal to i times i square, right? i square is negative 1, so if I do i times negative 1, it's going to be negative i. All right, so i to the third power is negative i. How about i to the fourth? Well, i to the fourth is simply i square times i square, which is negative 1 times negative 1. Okay? Negative 1 times negative 1 is simply 1. Alright? So what you need to remember is when you're dealing with um, imaginary numbers, this pattern keeps repeating itself forever. Okay? So if I wanted to do i to the 5th, guess what? i to the 5th is going to be exactly the same as i to the 1st, which is i. Okay? So how on earth is that possible? How do I know that i to the 5th is the same thing as i? Oh, well, check this out. Um, i to the 5th is i times i to the 4th, right? What is i to the 4th? i to the 4th is just 1, right? So you have i times 1, which is just i. Okay, so i to the 5th is i. Alright? And guess what? i to the 6th is the same thing as i squared. Right? Uh, and i squared is negative 1, so i to the 6th is negative 1. Alright, so this is negative 1 also. Oh wait, how on earth do I know that i to the 6th is negative 1? Exactly the same argument for i to the 5th, right? Because I know that i to the 6th is i squared times i to the 4th. And I know i to the 4th is 1, so let's just grab that out. Drop that, because that's just 1, right? And i squared is negative 1. Negative 1 times 1 is just negative 1. So you see this pattern keeps on repeating. Every time you have 4s, this pattern keeps on repeating, okay? So following that idea, i to the third, i to the seventh is i to the fourth times i to the third, which is negative i. And then i to the eighth is uh, one. You can, you can um, keep inspecting this pattern. you see that it continues forever. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to exploit this pattern to figure out what the sum is all the way to i to the 23rd. Okay? We're going to add everything. Okay, so since there's a pattern here, we don't need to list everything. We're just going to list a few, okay? So if you notice that the pattern goes up by 4, so i to the 4th, i to the 5th. If you add 4 to uh, 5, you're going to get i to the 9th. i to the 9th is going to be i. And then the pattern continues. And then i to the 9th, add another 4, you have i to the 23rd. <laughs> I'm sorry. You have i to the 13th i to the 13, and then that's for i, and then you have, add another 4, you have i to the uh, 17, then put the dot here, I don't need to write it, because it's the same pattern, 
da 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 and then jump another four i to the what's four plus twenty uh four plus seventeen twenty one right i to the twenty one which is i this one we we need to write it out so i to the twenty one and then um i to the twenty second which is negative one following this pattern and then i to the twenty third which is uh what is it negative one the next one is negative five okay so what we're going to do is we're going to be we're going to sum each row downwards and then sum our sums across all right so what's the sum adding down the sum here is i minus i cancels out minus one minus one cancels out so every time you add the first four you end up with zero if i add this one guess what zero if i add the, the ninth row this i to the ninth which is the third column is going to be zero if i add this one up it's going to be zero how do I know these are zero? Because they're exactly the same thing as long as the whole pattern is complete. But this one isn't complete though. This one, if you add this, is going to be the i's are going to cancel out, so this one's just going to be negative one. Okay, because this i and this i cancel out. So if you add everything across, your total sum is going to be um negative one. Alright, so that's your answer. Your answer is C. Okay, hope I hope you didn't get lost here because what I did here is I just went i minus one minus i plus one and then when you, when you group them together you have i minus i minus one plus one which comes out to zero so every time you have four of them like this together starting from this like this you have zero and then you, the pattern continues all the way okay so that's why your answer here is negative one because you didn't have uh, a positive one here to cancel out this one so that was your answer all right let's move on to question number nine uh, it says in an arithmetic series, the terms of a series are equally spread out. For example, in 1 plus 5 plus 9 plus 13 plus 17, consecutive terms are four apart. So what they're saying here is uh, every time you add four, you always add in four. That's what they mean by four apart. Okay. So the question is, if the first term of an arithmetic series is 3, the last term 136, the sum is 1390, what are the first three terms? So what are the first three terms? I know the first term is uh, three. So in order to figure out what the next terms are, I need to know the common difference. What separates them? That's known as a common difference. Common difference, which is uh, denoted by the notation D. All right, so that's what I'm looking for, D, okay? So let's write down some formulas. Um, I know the common difference, the formula for uh, the uh, arithmetic series and all the common difference is the nth term formula. A n equals a1 plus n minus 1 d. Okay. So I know a1 is 3. I know the last term, which is a n. a n is 136. Uh, my n is, I have no, absolutely no idea. Common difference is exactly what I need to solve this problem. So we have an equation. So here, if we want to use this equation, we have two unknowns. So it's impossible to solve an equation if you have two unknowns, okay? So um, using a1, an, and n, what formula can help me find out what n is? Check this out. I know the sum. That's a hint right there. The sum Sn is 1, 3, 9, 0. So if I use the SN formula, let's see, let me write down the SN formula. You're going to see something right now. The sum formula is SN equals N over 2 times A1 plus AN. So if you look at the sum formula, this formula can help us find what N is, right? Because I know I have only one unknown in this formula, which is N, because I know SN, I know A1, and I know AN. So we have one equation, one unknown. This can help me find N. And then I can then plug it in here to find D. Okay, so we're going to take a detour to find N with this formula first. And then we're going to come back here to find D. And then we can solve the problem. Okay. All right, so let's find N. SN, using this formula, is 1390. Uh, N over 2. We don't know what N is. A1 is 3. AN is 136. Okay. So we have 1390 equals N over 2. Uh, 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 3 plus 136 is 139. Like that. 
Okay. Now to get rid of this two, which is being divided, I'll multiply both sides by two. So times this by two, times that by two. Okay. And um, that's going to give me 3,780 equals, this turned out to cancel out 139N. Okay. To get N by itself, I divide both sides by 139. Divide both sides by 139. And the N that I need is going to be um, 20. Excellent. So N is 20. Now that I know what N is, I'm now confident to use this uh, nth term formula, the first formula that we have here, this one. I can now use this to find out what um, D is, and then I can then generate my, my terms, okay? All right, so let's plug in what we know. Uh-oh. Let's plug in what we know and find what we need, okay? So uh, what do I know? I know that... Um, I know an is 136, so put 136 here, 136 equals a1, the first term is 3, plus n, n is 20, minus 1, and d is what we're looking for, okay? All right, so let's do this. So we're going to have 136 equals 3 plus 20 minus 1 is 19, 19d. All right, using properties of uh, algebra, we're going to subtract 3 from both sides, okay? I will have 1, 133 equals 19D. To get D by itself, divide both sides by 19. Divide this by 19 and divide that by 19. And then we're going to have D equals 17. Okay? All right, so now what on earth is our first three terms? We know the first term is... 3. So what is the second term going to be? So the common, dif so the common difference um, is alright, uh, the common difference, wait a minute, uh, sorry I made a little typo here. Nine, 133 divided by 19 is 7. It's not 17. I'm just putting the 7 there. I don't, know. I don't know where the 1 came from. Anyway, common difference is 7. So this means that every time you add uh, 7, so the first term is 3. To get the next term, what do you do? You add 7. You plus 7, right? Plus 7. What's 3 plus 7? 10. That's the second term. And then the third term, what do you do? You add the common difference, right? Common difference is 7, so you add another 7. Plus 7. And 10 plus 7 is 17. Okay, so you see it? So the first three terms are 3 plus 7, 10. 717. Voila. That was the answer. Okay? So your answer is A. Alright, thanks so much for watching this uh, video. Please uh, subscribe to my channel for future updates. Um, and you can share the contents of this video with your friends. And also request videos um, on my YouTube page. Other videos can be found on myblogshop.com. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.